Good evening and welcome to KJZZ's Group 91.5, What I Wish I Knew About Guaranteeing Our Career Success. Um, I just want to recognize, before he goes back too far, Emilio Cabrera. He's been putting these together for us, and he handles our Group 91.5. Um, and Emilio will be leaving us tomorrow. He's going to one of the other colleges to work. But I want to acknowledge his efforts and say thank you, uh, Emilio, for all you do. So tonight is a very special evening. Um, we have a couple of great uh, tables that have represented some of what we want to get across. And we have Cynthia Dio back in the back there. And Cynthia is with Image in Marketing. Cynthia, do you want to wave? Um, and I encourage you all to stop in and check in with her when you leave tonight. And then also, Rio Salado's Career Services has a table to these two ladies that are here to help you with any questions you might have with education and furthering your education. So thank you for coming tonight, all of you. Um, we're very excited about our panel, but before we introduce um, our uh, host for the evening, I'd like to introduce our sponsor with Poison Pen, Bob Rosenwald. Po Poison Pen Press is one of the largest independent producers um, and publishers of hardcover mysteries in the world. They are based locally in Scottsdale and owned by Bob Rosenwald, who happens to be one of our Leadership Society members, too. Bob, would you like to come up for a couple minutes? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I'm just going to say a couple of words. I'm, I'm really glad that everybody who is here is here. Um, I was very much attracted to the subject um, of tonight's program because I've made more mistakes than uh, <laughs> well I hope I hope that none of you make as many let's put it that way I uh, used to say that I was a master of all trades and a, or a jack of all trades and a master of most um, that was back when I thought I knew something uh, and but, but I think more than anything I've 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 loved, I've been in the Valley now for 25 years. Um, I've loved uh, listening to KJZZ for the entire time. Uh, I think probably I got caught with Bob Corator's uh, blues <laughs> program on Saturday nights, uh, or Sunday nights rather, um, initially. But um, I, just, I just think that this is, I think it's great that all of you are here. Um, and, and about the only word of advice that I would give um, is find your passion, whatever it is, and do it. You've got um, incredible, incredible opportunities today uh, to do anything you want to do. And uh, admittedly, it takes maybe you, you know, willing to walk up to the edge of the cliff and jump off. But um, but if you're do not doing something, you really love doing don't do it i mean do something else so at any rate but i i'm looking forward to to hearing some of the program i'm going to have to leave a little bit early but thank you all for inviting me and thank you all for coming thank you bob now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator I call him our host because you hear him on air, uh, Nick Blumberg. Nick tells me he's been with us for four years. That's a long time, so um, he doesn't even look that old. <laughs> uh, Nick does a great job for us, so will you join me in welcoming Nick, and he'll introduce our panel. Thank you. I'll introduce the panel in just a moment, but first, if you haven't, please make sure you've got your cell phone on vibrate or silent. Uh, I'll be leading our panelists through a conversation for about an hour or so. Uh, if we don't address a topic that you are interested in hearing, you'll be able to chat with them as well as with our community partners here after the formal part of the conversation wraps up. Uh, and do stick around for the end of the discussion because we are giving away an HD radio. That that is true. That was not made up. <laughs> so to uh, to introduce our panel, uh, at the, the far end of the table, David Bruno is Senior Client Partner and Managing Director with DHR International, which is an executive search firm. Uh, he's been a, a big part of the company's growth from just 10 people in 1994 to more than 300 associates today. They've got dozens of offices around the world. 
Uh, David's done senior level recruiting work for everything from 10 person firms to Fortune 10 companies around the US and around the world. Uh, Mike Bontrager has worked in the construction industry for 30 years, 27 of them with the White's Company, where he currently serves as Executive Vice President. Uh, he's responsible for client services around the Southwest. Uh, in the past, Mike's also worked for White's federal contracting subsidiary and its industrial group. Uh, and he served in various roles like engineer and uh, project manager as well. And Katie Peshore is the founder of Inner Capital, which is an executive coaching firm uh, designed to get leaders from where they are to where they want to be. Uh, she serves on the board of Insight Enterprises and the Bank of Arizona. Uh, and Katie is also the chair of the nonprofit organization Experience Matters, which <clears throat> excuse me, which connects experienced adults with other nonprofits that can use the, uh, use their skills. So please join me in welcoming the panel. Uh, to, to start off with tonight, something, you know, a little, a little bit broader, rising to the next level within your company, you know, guaranteeing your career success. I think a lot of people are focused on the concept of, of rising to the next level, but I think we should talk about how you define that. I imagine that likely means different things for different people. Uh, Katie, I'd like to start with you with that. Um, how do I define the next level? Is yeah, how do you, saying? you know, within your career within your company, mm -hmm. what is the next level? What are the things that you look for to define that? Okay. Well, I think that's a good question. I guess I would start a little more personally, which is um, early on in my career, I think the company defined for me what the next level meant. You know, what would it take? I started out as an accountant. What would it take to be promoted to one level, to be promoted to the next? So, you know, young and just getting to know the industry, I let the company shape me. I think in later years, um, I've taken a lot more satisfaction by defining for myself where do I want to go and how do I want to spend my time and what type of um, commitment do I want to make to work. So I would say it's a very different question depending on where you are in the arc of your career um, as far as how many choices you have and, and what to you means the next level. So traditionally, it would just be that hierarchy, a manager and then a director and then a vice president, and I, I think that's how I spent my first 20 years. But now being an owner of my business and being in charge of my time um, and what clients I choose to work with, for me now that's, that's my promotion. Of course, I gave that to myself. Okay. <laughs> Still counts. <laughs> right. Uh, Mike, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, my career path has been somewhat like Katie's in that I started out as an engineer right out of school and uh, in a very prescriptive environment. So it was really defined for me, and the next levels were were well defined. Mm -hmm. So there was a there was a career path there, and you know it was natural to to work to progress up through that. And as you get to a certain level, <coughs> the same skills that you had to move up begin to change. And uh, there's a few things that that are common to that, and one of those is. Uh, passion that was mentioned uh, by our sponsor which I think is hugely important if you don't have it you need to get it somehow um, and then there's uh, just a positive attitude I mean attitude is everything if you if you have a willingness and a desire to succeed and move to the next level you will do it because that that attitude will carry you with you and and uh, when I say positive you know nobody nobody likes a water cooler whiner so, you know, don't be one of those, would be my advice there. <laughs> David, what would you say about that? Well, I think looking around the room, um, most of you are a different generation. We, were all, we all grew up in defined moments where human resources, personnel development was an integral part of the company. Very few companies do that today. So you are now responsible on your own for learning out what your next level is. And the definition that I use is that if you get too comfortable with your job, you're ready to go to the next level. And that, to me, if you're comfortable, that's a death knell. And you, get, you come to work every day, do the same thing every day, and nobody bothers you, and you think that's a great scenario. Reality is you need to find something that will put you on the cutting edge again. Find something that you're going to take a risk for. And being promotable is that somebody who is willing to take that risk. Um, that's really for me. When you think about moving up to the next level, what does somebody not want to do? What do I want to do? And you marry those two by saying, 
you know what? I'm just way too comfortable. I like my job. I like my people around me. There's no tension. There's no stress. It's, it's easy. And if you, if you find yourself too comfortable, it's time for you to rise to the next level. But you are in control today. There is no HR department that sits down with you and says, well, you've done these 10 things today. You've got through that five training program. That not happened because companies cut that out. The expense control negated that. So what you have to do is own this, own the scenario. What will make me uncomfortable and yet not get me fired? No. Well, yeah. And I mean, is, is it a question of finding a way to, to take a risk or do something new within your company? Or is it a question of finding somewhere else to work? Or perhaps does it depend on the individual situation? Well, if you don't mind, um, both of you, I mean... We are all very good friends, and I'll tell you a story at the end, but uh, right now, um, reality is that you have, if you're not learning, if you're not growing, you're in the wrong spot. No matter if you've been in the company 10 years or two minutes, reality, and I learned this lesson from my own children, who my daughter's here in the, in the crowd, so I can't say too many things embarrassing, but I noticed that if they're not learning, they move on. It's a pretty big risk to take. That if the company says to me, you know, keep on doing the same thing, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, so you really have to keep that in mind. And I don't want to uh, overpower the conversation. I'll let you two. Well, I guess I, I, to add to that, I, would, I was there at one point in time. You know, the, the, I was really just going through the motions. Uh, the project assignments were, uh, you know, not very challenging. And, and you got a little complacent, I would say. Uh, comfortable, as David would put it. And um, so I looked around within the company, and there was not an opportunity for me there. And I did decide to leave, and uh, it was the best decision I ever made. Now, it was a very careful, calculated decision. It didn't make it, you know, uh, on the spur of the moment. There was a lot of agony that went with that. Um, however, when I left and went to work for another company, I got thrown into a very uncomfortable situation of managing about 30 people of which I had no experience whatsoever and quick learning curve uh, worked there for three years learned a ton came back to the company that I would left in a much better position had a lot of new skills um, and got promoted instantly so uh, you know for me it was a, it was a great experience and I wouldn't I wouldn't change it I think you have to ask yourself, what is the source of your discontent? Uh, you know, do you feel that you should be at a higher level than you are right now, or do you think they ought to be paying you more than they do, or that you shouldn't have to work such long hours? Um, or is it that there's something you're drawn to do, you know, differently, or something you want to, to go and learn? Because I do run into people who feel that their job is not giving them what it should, and I'm not sure that's the right question. You know, I think you first want to ask, am I giving my job everything I can? And, you know, where is my future here? But, you know, I'll give you an example. I had someone that came in uh, for some coaching, and they had looked for a long time for a job and hadn't found something, finally found something. The person there was going on a, a medical leave and agreed to take them on and teach them, you know, uh, the job so they could do it while this person left. And then someone else called them that they'd interviewed with earlier. And they said, you know, I, I think I should leave and go take this. This is a better job. I've only been here six weeks. And I thought, wow, you know, somebody gave you a shot at a job because they were going on leave. You hadn't been employed for a year and had been looking everywhere. And now after six weeks, you think it'd be okay to just say, meh, you know, somebody better called. I don't think that's a good idea. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, I see a better opportunity, but it's another thing to meet the commitment you have made. So I would ask yourself first, you know, am I giving everything I can to my job and to my employer? And then say, where else do I see room for growth? My, my guess, Mike, is you probably left your first employer graciously, or they wouldn't have wanted you back three years later when you had all this experience. My guess is they brought you back at a higher salary, too. Yes. But, you know, tell us a little bit about how you left, because my, I think that matters. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's like I said, you, you, I had, at the time, I had done all the toughest, I had taken on all the tough assignments. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had built all the biggest projects. Um, you know, we 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 didn't have a strategy going forward. There wasn't any growth plan mm -hmm. for the company. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I had great relationships with the individuals that I work with, my bosses, and I really went in and explained to them the situation I was in and the opportunity that they had, and they actually said, well, gee, we're really going to miss you, but you really can't pass that up. You, mm. you should go do it. Mm. And uh, so when, you know, I, I kept in contact with them as I was in my uh, painful stage, as I like to call it, for three and a half years. Um, and when it was time to come back, the company had decided they wanted to grow. And uh, when I came back in a much different position, and it just worked out well for me. But I will tell you that the, to make the decision to leave, even with all that, was was a difficult decision to make and took a lot of time and, and calculation and thought. And it wasn't oh, you, you something You weren't leaving else. in a huff. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. no. Well, and, you know, sort of that, that introspection, that what do I want from this job? Am I giving everything to this job? One of the things that I was curious to ask you all about is the idea of, of personality and your awareness of personality, both of your own and those of the people with whom you're working or, the, you know, of your supervisor. How important of a role does that play in career success? And do you think people are as attuned to that as they ought to be? David, can you start with that? I think I call it peripheral vision. And you really have to know your surroundings and take the time, as Mike mentioned. And by the way, he did that because he's an engineer. Engineers are very, very detailed. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I think that you really have to be very, very um, uh, cognizant of that point. And um, I love these two, so I'd like to hear what they have to comment on. Well, I would say you've hit on, on the key. If there's something you could do now that would serve you well for the rest of your years, it would be to invest in some self-awareness. Yeah. I don't know if some of your companies have given you DISC or Myers-Briggs or Emergenetics or the Enneagram. You know, there's a bunch of different tests or assessments out there that you could use to shed a little light on yourself. Many people use those assessments to explain what's wrong with their boss. That's not really the, that's <laughs> that's not not really the point. <laughs> okay. Um, the point is for you to understand more about yourself so you could optimize maybe that intersection between your boss's style and yours or how you act on a team. And I would say once I started seriously investing in that for myself and understanding more about my natural style and how I came across to people, that's when I started making some progress and, and certainly became a better manager. So I don't know how many of you have taken some of those or been exposed to those. Do you do those at your company? or? We do. Uh, we, use, we, we, we don't use Myers-Briggs, but we do DISC, mm -hmm. D-I-S-C, and um, it is – a very powerful tool if you've never taken the test. The test is, is very easy and it, it will define your, your preferred work style and it will also uh, help you to understand if you're adapting. So, you know, if you're not working uh, in your preferred work style, it can point that out as well. And it's a great tool because what it, it's exactly what Katie said. It, it helps you maximize your ability to relate to people around you. And relationships and communication are everything mm -hmm. uh, not just this thing over here it's everything so learning to communicate and learning to relate to people is a huge skill to learn and will propel you upward uh, at a much faster rate yeah. I think if I may add to that too rising to the next level managing your boss is a tool that's essential because you not only have to manage your boss whoever that might be whatever personality that is that really is a leadership skill. And again, rising to the level, if your boss has the professional peripheral vision that he needs to have or she needs to have, they're going to notice your ability to do that. And you are in control of your own emotions. Don't, you know, I mean, because your boss may come in and start ranting and raving, you don't have to react to that. And there's a great book that I read many years ago dealing with, with difficult people. Everyone has a style. And it's up to you to read that style and then manage accordingly. You don't get to pick your boss. Sometimes you don't even get to pick your peers or your subordinates. So that's a part of life. And that ability to move upward is being able to deal with a multitude of personalities. There's a lot of corporations today that deal in matrix management. Uh, in our organization, I have uh, from eight of us in the company to now 53 offices around the world, and every different nationality, from Singapore to South Africa to Chile, uh, to we have people all over. 
Everyone has a different personality. Everyone manages different. And if you don't have this vision to say, how do I make, how do I get to my goal with this piece of business, with that personality, how can I manage that forward? So the sooner you get to know yourself, whether it's by a disc, whether it's just sitting down, I like to have a good cigar to think, uh, but just knowing what you like, what will set you off. And when you begin to see that ticking that way, you are in control. You stop it. You move on, change the subject, but you master control of that. That's what makes you promotable, being able to handle those difficult situations no matter who you're up against because you won't choose. And if you want to be in the business world, if you will, uh, or even not for profits, you better learn how to manage your own personality so you can better go forward. Well, and the idea that you have to, you know, going back to what you said earlier, that you really, in many instances, have to take charge of your own professional development. If that is something that you take the lead on, if you invest in, you know, coaching on your own, if you do some of these personality tests, if you learn new skills that make you more valuable to your company, how do you, what is the best way to demonstrate that to your employer without, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, looking like you're trying to show off? You know, how do you show them this is what I've done, this is what I've learned, and this is how I can apply it. You know, are, 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 are there good tactics to, you know, to engage with your employer and show them what you've done? Well, certainly, I, I think you'd have to choose something that works for your circumstance. But, for instance, if you go to a conference and you learn something there, I think offering to your boss who paid for you to go to the conference that you'll come back and do a recap or do a little mini presentation or explain a new concept or something you learned in training to your staff or to your peer group or to the staff meeting you go to, you know, is a great way to get you in front of people. And it's also a way for your boss to know that they made an investment in you being gone for two or three days and attending a conference and you learned something. Okay. And that's, that's really helpful. And often nowadays there isn't uh, the kind of budget to send everybody to a conference. So to come back and give them a taste of that, I think, is helpful. So you can do that type of thing. Um, asking to take on a new assignment or being willing to be part of a committee or a project team, especially if it's cross-functional. You know, if you're in accounting, you may not work with engineers a lot, or you may not work with people in HR, and it could really help, you know, if you would volunteer to be on something cross-functional, um, I think is another way of seeing people pick up skills and demonstrate what they know. Yeah, I would. I would just reinforce what Katie said, working on committees uh, internally, uh, becoming the chair, uh, getting you know a special project, getting a place where you have access to more people so you can subtly um, kind of show off your newly found skill is, is very important. And, and you know we don't want to be boastful, uh, yet you do need the opportunity to get access to people who can see you. And, uh, you know, don't pass up an opportunity to, to attach your name to successes. Yours, of course. <laughs> uh, not everybody else's, but, uh, and, and you can do that in a subtle way that, that lets people know that, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Jody's really doing well, and, you know, that's... Well, and I think the willingness to, to do extra work. You know, right. if you, let's say something goes wrong and they put together a quality team to figure out what went wrong, that's going to take extra work. I mean, that's above and beyond your assignment. Or if your company's installing SAP or some big new CRM system, you know, that takes a lot of effort or work. So I think being willing to go the extra distance, um, you know, and genuinely do the work, it's not showing off if you can back it up, okay? <laughs> but I do think it takes extra effort. Yeah. I, I think so. I didn't grow up in human resources. I grew up as a buyer with uh, Federated Department Stores, which is now Macy's. Uh, and in ingrained in me is return on investment. Anything I do or anything I'm exposed to, I want a return, time, energy, whatever it might be. It's just the fundamental basics I have. So when I do anything or take on, a, what am I going to get out of it? Now, it sounds kind of uh, 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 egocentric, but reality is if I don't get anything out of it, neither will you. So if you see an opportunity pop up and you say, I can learn this, I know I may not be able to go to uh, the concert tonight, so but I'll save five more hours, and this is what I'm going to learn. This is the risk I'm going to take to go out there and do that. That knowledge base will help you who, never, who knows when, but that is ex extremely important. I'm not a fan. Again, I grew up in corporate America, and there is an awful lot of illusion of motion, I call it. 
you had to be there on Saturday, so you put your jacket on your desk, and you turn your papers around, and you went downstairs and had coffee. And everybody was down there, so I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so my viewpoint working? was, don't judge me on that. I'm not going to waste my time down there. If I have something to do, I'll be here. Now, that's not necessarily very well accepted, but performance, or as Katie said, that you were really doing something important. So you get rid of that judging factor of the illusion of motion. So those are the very important things. But I, I do think that even my volunteer work t today, as it was back then, what am I going to get out of it and what am I going to give to somebody else? And I do hope each and every one of you leave here tonight, not with a warm and fuzzy, but an actionable item. If you don't, all three of us will apologize. We wasted your time. Reality is, is you've got to help us help you answer those questions that are pertinent to you. And if we fail at that, you've wasted your time. Don't do it again. Well, and I think it's interesting, you know, the idea of, you were talking about, Mike, putting yourself in the position to, to get noticed for your work. How much of that is building relationships? And what's the importance of building relationships within your company, not necessarily with your supervisor and the people that you work with, but with people who work in, you know, like Katie was saying, in, in another area? How... How key can that be to moving up to, to continuing your development? Oh, well, it's huge. Uh, I, I would, you know, like I said before, relationship building is, is, a, is everything, as long as they're positive um, and they're good. Um, you know, getting a network of people within a company across departments can do a lot of things for you. One, you, you're spreading your brand. And, you know, every one of you has a brand. You just don't know it. And you're building your brand every time you sit in a meeting, every time you uh, do a project, every time you, you know, whatever you do, you're building your personal brand. And spreading that brand around amongst, you know, across departments is very important. One, they'll know who you are. And then when it comes time to get something done, you will have the relationships to actually get it done where a lot of your peers will not. And that makes you valuable. And it also adds to your brand. There's, there's, you know, I can count on Jody because she can get it done because she knows everybody. And that, you know, the more valuable you become, the higher you get. I think that my personal network after 35 years here in Phoenix is probably the most valuable business asset that I have. But a lot of the value of it has come many years after the relationship. So people say, well, gosh, how do you know these folks? You don't start out by saying, I wonder what you could do for me, okay? <laughs> you know, you don't start out as a taker. Um, you start out giving, you know, gee, I've met this new person. I wonder what I could do for them. You know, can I introduce them to someone? Can I help them with the job? Particularly people that are looking for jobs. It's, very, it's a very vulnerable feeling when you're looking for a job. So when people call and they want advice or they want to meet me for coffee or they want to ask some questions, I try to be very helpful with, with that type of individual because years from now they'll have a job and I'll need something or I'll want to sell something to their business and they will remember me. So early on what really impressed me is my, my first boss, I remember watching a guy next to me lose his job, get fired. And I was, you know, the next day I came into work and I heard my boss on the phone with this guy and I'm like, I thought you just fired him. Well, yeah, but I'm helping him get a job. And I was like, how could that be? He said, well, just because it isn't working out here doesn't mean he won't be great somewhere else. So that just made such an impression on me, you know, that this constant, what else could I do for you, um, you know, really is, is the way to get started, I think. And then when you're our age, you do know everyone, and you, and you can get a lot done. Can't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the tags are for. <laughs> But this is the master networker, so you, you, you tell us about that. You know, I, I think we are role models for you. Katie and I have interacted 10 years ago, mm -hmm. began. No idea where our relationship would end. Mike and I know each other for probably the same amount of time. He and I were in a CEO forum together where we really talked about for three hours very detailed pieces of information. Katie, I had the absolute pleasure of representing her for the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce CEO presidency job as a search. Katie stood in front of seven gentlemen who were staunch Republicans, and Katie is a blessed Democrat 
And she <laughs> you're letting the all room. the secrets out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody's she clear literally the owned the room. And from that point in time, Katie and I became very close, if I may say so. Mm-hmm. But we never know how we interact. It's, it's not <laughs> networking that I know her name. It's a relationship. Because uh, I knew what I wanted from Katie. She knew what she wanted from me. We both were partners in the whole process. So when I said, you got to, you know, get, you do something for return on investment, you've got to give something an investment. An investment doesn't mean I take. Uh, I just gave up um, oh, seven years with the chamber today, and I looked at my return on investment. It was tenfold of between paying my dues and the number of hours I put in. I got more back what I gave, but I got more back. So with with all three of us, engineer, an accountant, and a flake. And in reality, we all figure out a way that we can help each other, but I've gotten more from these two than they've given me. And that's, that's really, that is a relationship. And whether it starts when you met your roommate in college or the, your, your cellmate at, at the company, you know, I, those so cubicles. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be yeah. cube? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah cube. <laughs> Tent city. I, th- I think of this, uh, I'm a Dilberg fan in the, right. as, as a cell. Uh, but you never know and you always have to protect that. And as Katie said, firing somebody doesn't mean you don't like them anymore. Mm. You're straight and honest with them. You tell them, it's not working here. Move on. Well, so. or Mike leaving his company and then coming back yeah. three years later. You know, I mean, relationships mm-hmm. like that don't end. But, you know, many of you, do you feel that you're too young to start networking or it's just because we're so old? Because <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely never too young. I mean, I have people from college, you know, that I'm still in contact with. My first job, those people uh, 35 years ago were all young little folks, but they've grown up to be pretty impressive. You know, 35 years later, you wouldn't believe what their job is. Surprises you, doesn't it? It does, it does. (laughs) So you really need to start where you are right now, you know, because five or ten years from now, those are are folks that are going to be able to help you out. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, Maybe just show of hands, how many of you currently work for a company with more than 25 employees? How about more than 50? more than 100? Okay. So we have some big, and then some of you work for much smaller companies, right? Or maybe some of you aren't working. I saw you laugh. <laughs> okay, I just wondered, you know, as far as the audience feel, what uh, what size you were working Well, and I was, you know, when you're talking about relationships, David, and when you're talking about, you know, sort of representing Katie in this, this search program and the relationship that's come out of that, I'm also curious to talk about mentoring and what role, you know, having a mentor can play. And, you know, you and I were talking about this a, a little bit before the event. I mean, how how important can that be on sort of bo- both ends of the relationship? Well, once again, I'll go back to the role modeling. Companies have boards of directors, and Katie is a, an expert at being on the board of directors. And you mentioned brand. You are a brand. You are a business. So you should have a board of directors, and let's call them mentors. And each mentor, it doesn't have to be one. Uh, it could be within your company if you if your community is of that nature or your personnel of your company your culture is part of that uh, APS does that they have they have very defined processes for mentoring some small companies don't do that but you have to say what am I missing and where can I go get that information from that becomes your mentor maybe an accountant maybe an engineer it may be a marketing person it may be just somebody who you have a great deal of respect for because they have a great work-life balance. Not a business decision, but they know how to balance their work and life. You see them go home at 5 o'clock, and they're in at 8 o'clock. They get all their work done. Hey, I want to learn how to do it. That becomes a mentor for you, something that's missing in your own bag of tools. And that's what I look at and search. What is in your toolbox? What have you sharpened? What have you let lay? lay there but it's my job to find out what you so to me that's the way to approach it yeah i i would i i got extraordinarily lucky in my career because i always had uh, a series of, of people that were helping me along the way early in my career i i picked a, a high performing peer basically and we competed with each other in a friendly way and pushed each other forward. So whatever he was learning, I wanted to learn. Whatever I was learning, he wanted to learn. And we fed off each other. And uh, we're, that was you know almost 30 years ago. And, and we're terrific friends. And we both have uh, advanced in our careers almost to the top. 
and uh, it's been fun to watch and we still kind of do that to this day the other thing that I did uh, was join a CEO forum which is a roundtable group like a Y it's kind of a YPO format and that was the best thing I ever did uh, it gave me a chance to uh, lay my cards on the table in a confidential way and get a lot of excellent advice from people who had been there and done that and if you can find that in any kind of an organization it is hugely valuable you your learning will accelerate times 10 and uh, you'll realize that you know everybody's human and we're all going through much the same thing so Yes, I've had several mentors, and I would encourage you to, to maybe have one for each area that's challenging. For instance, I had a mentor that helped me with being the only woman in, a, in an office full of men at the time, so sometimes you have a challenge like that. Perhaps you want to find someone who's also been an international student or is Hispanic or just came out of the Army or, you know, whatever special quality you feel you may have. Then someone, as Mike said, who's a peer but doesn't work at your company. Um, I think it's tough to have someone at your company. Was he with you at the he same was. place? So that's kind of unusual, I think. But, you know, if you're a software engineer, maybe someone who's a software engineer at a different company kind of helps you compare notes. And then someone maybe two or three levels up that you hope to be in three to five years, I think is very helpful because they have enough distance that they're not competing with you for a promotion or, you know, trying to get the same job you are. And they can probably look back and say, here's some things you ought to think about or, you can go to them after you've gotten passed over for promotion or blown an interview, and they can say, well, you know, here's what you might have thought about. <laughs> it's very helpful to have that kind of advice. Um, I brought my mentor tonight. Reverse mentoring. You probably read about it in some of the newspapers. They're talking a lot about it. But I did it unknowingly. Um, being as old as I am, dealing with computers and all the new technology out there, just went over my head. I just couldn't understand it. So Kate, my daughter here in the red, bioengineer, biotech, undergrad, biology major, uh, she saw me fussing and fuming, and she began to slowly take me on. To, so now when I travel, no matter where I'm at, I get communications, I get information. People don't know where I'm at. Are you in the cloud, good. David? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not in the cloud. Yes, he is. <laughs> but I will tell you that that quid pro quo scenario that I talked about, you mentor an older person who is struggling, and you can see it with your peripheral vision, that they're, they're struggling with that new database or struggling with that new report, and they can't figure out how to get the keys to work the right way. Great opportunity for you to mentor them. Therefore, you learn what you want to know as a mentee as you mentor. So that reverse mentoring is an ideal scenario. I am... Uh, I am we just had our international conference a couple, um, a couple months ago in Chicago. I was fooling around with my my little uh, phone, and these we have younger researchers. They said, "How did you know that? Most of the people here don't even know. They don't. They don't even go online. How do you do that?" So I bragged a little bit and said, "Yeah, I learned from them one of the best. You know, uh, and it works wonders." So keep that in mind. That quid pro quo of learning and giving, you learn while you teach, and you will learn a lot by being taught so both ways yeah. that almost sounds a little bit of the idea that you have to you have to give you have mm -hmm. to put yourself out there to get you know yeah. to get something back you thought it was just my good looks that i got this far right yeah <laughs> that's a joke folks i'm teasing that well a nice suit helps too <laughs> um I, i'm curious to know your perspective on this what is something that an employee can do to increase their skill set to increase their value that doesn't cost a lot of money there are obviously different ways that, you know, things you can invest in, you know, programs that you can go through. But, you know, someone who's who's just starting out who maybe isn't making a great deal of money, what's something relatively inexpensive that you would recommend them uh, recommend for them to do? Well, there's certainly an awful lot of online learning, <clears throat> and that's to me is a, a blessing. I listen to an awful lot of lectures um, that are free online. The things that I just don't know about. Um, Kid got into bioengineering, biotech. I knew nothing about that. Couldn't even pronounce half the words. The definitions were even difficult for me. Going online, talking to people, and being able to see that was very beneficial. And I'm sure the same thing happens with you. And at first, it may seem like it's Russian or a foreign language, but the more you expose yourself, the better it is. So, yeah, I um, there's this thing out there I discovered called the internet, 
And um, there's a lot Somebody of stuff. Somebody needs to on mentor there. him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm amazed at what I can type into the Google search bar and, and find. It's it's almost as if uh, there it's too much. So you know I, I do a lot of learning actually that way now. Um, and there's a, there's you know like I mentioned before, committees, volunteer organizations, uh, nonprofits, chair. I mean there are just a bunch of things that you can get yourself involved in that will teach you you know how to deal with people um, a lot of interpersonal skills if you become a committee chairman there's a leadership role there that uh, will make you uncomfortable if you've never done it and uh, just a lot of things like that and then a lot of the bigger companies do have uh, will pay to to send you to certain kinds of training um, you know I know we had a lot of employees go to Toastmasters uh, and things like that that were relatively inexpensive. Well, I'll I'll just tell you what's impressed me lately is uh, because there is almost too much on the internet. People that do a good job of filtering down to the company they're working for now, who are their major competitors, you know what's happening in their industry, um, maybe being sure that you're getting a feed or a Google alert or something for your new products or for the people you're competing with. Something that, that hones it down and makes it actionable. Um, then when I'm talking with that person, it sounds like, wow, they, they really know something about our business. Not just their little job, but our business. You know, what context are we operating in? And then uh, one of the companies I work with had an interesting contest last year for their employees. It was, you know, Shark Tank, like from Shark Week. And people in divisions had to come up with their best idea, and they did a little shark uh, week within their division, and then you know came up to where they had the top two or three. So they competed against each other for the best idea of how to make an improvement in the company. And you know they got prizes and everything, but the CEO and people from the board watched the finals, and it was very impressive what individuals came up with as to how we could improve the processes in our own company because they were thinking. They weren't just saying, "Oh, I show up eight to five. This is my job." They were like, where does this matter? And how does it fit in? And what are our competitors doing? And how could we get ahead? And what could we do? That was impressive to me. And it didn't cost them anything to do that. But it really showed initiative. And, you know, the people who did come up with the best idea, they're working on making it come true now. And they certainly have a lot of focus and attention um, from the executive team. So something like that costs nothing, you know, but the results were really impressive. We started off uh, talking about a uh personality and you know how that can play into your success similar to that how do you how much does the culture of a company play into an employee's success and and their satisfaction working there and are people as aware of that as they should be do they make an effort to you know to try to suss that out and to fit in there um, Katie I'll, I'll start with you for that well I'm just grinning because if you saw the <laughs> Sunday New York Times which is something I read, the Sunday business section, they looked at a huge study, I think it was 12,000 employees, about what actually makes people do well, what makes people go above and beyond. And it was some fairly simple things, but it involved culture, and most companies were not willing to, to do what it took. So one of the things was physical comfort, being able to get up every 90 minutes or so, take a break, walk around, make a phone call, go outside, eat an apple, something like that. Um, spiritually being involved in the mission of the company and feeling that what you did mattered, um, having a chance to be involved in things that you really feel are interesting and that you can do well, and something else that I've forgotten. So there was four things. And it was they, a five-page article. <laughs> yes, yes. But they ran, they ran an experiment with that in, a, in an accounting firm during tax season, and they put 50 folks in a control group and 50 folks, they did just those five things. This group was much more productive left earlier, did a better job on the client, and at the end of the season, the company said, well, we're not going to make those changes because it just seems like too cultural. It just seems too mushy, even though they had proof that that's what it takes for people to do well. So I think you have to be responsible for yourself for finding a culture where you feel connected you know, to the mission and you know what the mission is and you see how your little piece you know, uh, fits into that and you know, where you feel physically, it's an acceptable environment. You know, I have some friends that are software engineers that have been willing to contribute to a culture where they work 16 hours a day and eat junk food and sleep at their desk. That's wrong. I don't admire that. Okay, so if that's the kind of culture you're stuck in, I think you have to really think about that. Is that sustainable? 
So those types of things are, are part of culture. It really does matter. And I think you have to ask yourself if you have a good fit. Yeah, so I, I interview a lot of people and a lot of college graduates uh, and a lot of people that are uh, older than that that come into the company. And I'm amazed at the lack of awareness of culture. The uh, When I took over the office here in 2003, we made it a part of our strategic plan to improve our culture and make it a place where people could perform well, where they loved coming to work, where we delighted the customers, where you know we were very collaborative, very team oriented. We changed everything. We changed our office layout. Uh, we, we just changed everything. And then we filtered our hires uh, by that culture. So we would not hire anybody if they we didn't think they would fit. And once we started to do that and mold the culture, you, the people that didn't fit that were already there started to stand out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. Most of them left on their own. Um, so I view culture as a huge thing. Not only is it does it make for a great place to work, it can be a strategic advantage too. Um, but I see people who jump to companies, well, okay, a couple things. When I see a resume and I look at the companies and I know what the cultures are like there, I won't hire them. Especially if they've been there a long time because they, if one, have adopted a really bad culture because I know what it's like and I can't, you know, it, it, it's not going to work for us. So, you know, and I also have to question the decision of them going to work for them in the first place. I mean, how did they come to that decision? Uh, you know, and what did they've been there nine years and they didn't notice that there was something incredibly wrong there. Uh, so I think it's a hugely important thing. And I, I think you should do research on the company. I think you should talk to people who are working there to find out what is their work experience. Do they like it? You know, what is the boss like? What is, you know, how does it work there? I mean, those to me, those things are huge. And I, I unfortunately see a lot of young people making mistakes there. Well, that sounds like a potentially challenging for people, though, who if they're unemployed or if they're newly out of school, you know, if they're if they're really just looking for work, if they need to find something. I mean, it sounds like to me you would be caught, you know, cautioning them that, look, I know you need work. I know you want to find something. But if if this isn't going to be something that reflects well on your resume, this could hurt you down the road. Is that true? I mean, do you do you do you look at it differently if it's somebody who was taking that on as a first job or is that still a, a huge factor for you in this day and age you can find out almost anything you want to about a company so i really don't feel that just because it's your first job or or you've been out for a while taking going to a company that you know is dysfunctional or has a place where you can't perform your best is still a mistake and you can almost always find somebody who knows something. Um, you know, I've even had people in my company who have been called by people who they didn't even know. Or they got a, a LinkedIn message from somebody they did not know wanting to inquire about what it was like to work there because they were going to send in their resume. So there are ways to make those connections and find out, you know, what kind of environment you're going into. Um, you know, you, you've all talked about this in one sense or another, but how important is that work-life balance to your career success and finding somewhere that you can, you know, you can do good work without working 16-hour days and without, you know, being there on, on a Saturday, standing around, not, not getting anything done? Cemetery is full of people who thought they couldn't be replaced. Um, to me, it's abs I, I think it's extremely important. Your most creative moments come when you're not under pressure. And if you're constantly under pressure, working 16 hours a day, eating pizza, sleeping underneath there, um, the probability of you being successful is slim to none. I, over time, your body will shut down on you, and then your mind will shut down on you. Every, every part I mean, of your body needs to be rested. Your mind, your arms, leg, all that. So if you just be logical about realizing that you can't do that and you've got to have that balance. It, the, I talk about peripheral vision. I learned a lot 
when I was coaching as a volunteer. I brought that into the workplace. That was the greatest learning lesson I had over my, my many years. So you never know, and if you have this peripheral vision, you'll be picking up things, volunteer work. You learn so much, but you can't be doing that at work all the time, so you need a place to go and do that. So I think those are extremely important. And Katie, I want to let you know, I get the uh, Wall Street Journal six days a week, but on Sunday I get the New York Times <laughs> just so I can fill that balance. I, I know you probably don't believe that, but I do. I, I, I do balance it, though. But, and, that, and that's my point, too, is that this work-life balance, what is it that makes you feel relaxed and open to some new idea? What moment? Is it petting your cat? Is it walking your dog? Is it talking to your best friend about nothing? And then your spouse comes back and say, what do you guys talk about? Nothing. But it makes you feel good, and it makes you feel energized. So that work-life balance uh, is critical. As a matter of fact, to your point, Mike, uh, where a culture comes where they're working long hours and all the rest of it, that to me is a big character flaw. If you don't have the intestinal forward to say, I'm going home to my family, I'm not doing this project, or the illusion of motion, you're just looking like you're working, and you're not getting anything done. Uh, well, I, you know, I've found out the time management is just a, is a problem. It's just a huge issue. You only have so much time on the planet. And I'm a little bit of a contrarian when it comes to work-life balance, and, and I agree with David that you certainly do not want to burn yourself out, and you do need to have time to recharge. There's no question about it. However... Um, the more time you spend on something, the more reward you will get, assuming it is time that you are spending, you know, productively. Uh, there, you, you're not going to rise up through a company working 40 hours a week at any kind of rapid pace. So, it, to me, it's a personal decision as to, you know, where do you want to spend your time? Uh, if, if you really are ambitious and you do want to move up in a company, you're going to have to work more and be more productive and spend more hours doing that than you are, you know, petting your cat or other things. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, you're a dog lover. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit contrarian there. I believe that you, you will reward where you spend your time, and you know, um, but I, I don't think you should kill yourself either. Right, but I think it goes back to that first comment about knowing yourself, about self awareness. If you want to be the CEO of the next Google, well, then you're making a choice, okay? And you are going to work constantly, and you're going to be gone all the time, and you're not going to be home with your kids or your family. So if that is your goal, then set that as your goal, and you would have a balance in that you're achieving what you wanted. You know, you have to be clear about that. I think the tension or the friction comes in not owning up to what you really want and then being unhappy with what you've got, mm -hmm. okay? So if you want to create a software company and you do want to work 16 hours a day in the garage, okay, you know, but then don't also complain that you don't have time to go to yoga. You know, it's like you're making a choice. So I have four children that I had during my career, and that was a choice, and there was a lot of friction there, and, and you can't do both, okay? You can't be home all the time and, you know, be the head of a big business. So you have to make some choices, and I think that work-life balance is a weird term because there is no balance. There's just flow. You know, there's good days, there's bad days. There's times when one of your kids are sick and you need to be home. There's times when your parents have a problem, you need to be out of town. I mean, it's flow. It's not balance. My life has never been balanced. And I'm sure you would all agree to that. Since you told a tale of yourself, same with me. I grew up in corporate America, mm -hmm. and every promotion meant more work, more hours, mm -hmm. more time devoted to it. I always wanted to be the senior most HR person because I love the t finding the talent. I love adding new to the business. What I found out when I finally got the title, when I fought for this for 20 plus years, I hated it. I hated it. I had benefit meetings. I had insurance meetings. Boring as hell. Compensation committee meetings. I'm like, where, where am I? strategizing about business. Mm -hmm. This isn't business. This is administration. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait. And so when David Hoffman, the founder of DHR, came to me and said, here's a crazy idea. You're, I have no salary. 
its commission. There's six of us that we think we can take on the world. I want to take this company to XYZ. I'm like, you know what? I got married to have children. And I want my children, when they're in desperate need, to say dad, not mom. And as I f- came up the ladder, I was always working. Mm-hmm. Saturdays, Sundays, I wore a suit and tie because at May Company Corporate, where I was, Sunday, we were allowed to wear sport coats. God. <laughs> yeah. And, but we had a tie. But that's the way you got promoted. And mm-hmm. I was waiting to be senior VP of HR, and I had to go through that. Mm-hmm. In the meantime... I had two great kids. I had a wife. I got married to him. I was like, I never saw him. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? Do you pro- I can have my life back. And my- what did I get married for? What did I have children for? For this crazy title that I thought, and I was bored to my, I'm not a good sitter. I'm, I'm sitting here a long time. I- I'm not a good sitter. So I sat through these meetings and I said, that's enough. What can I do? And I took that risk. And it was phenomenal. I mean, I am blessed that we are to where we are today, but I did it because I'm family first. Well, and even, you know, the idea that, Mike, you're a little bit of a contrarian, which I guess I'm naturally attractive, but, you know, like, I, I like that. I think that's an interesting idea, but how much of that is being at the right place? You know, even if you're willing to work a 10 or 12 hour day, if you're willing to go the extra mile, you know, do, do you have to first make sure that you're in the right company, that you're in the right position before you're willing to do that and, and not burn out and not kill yourself doing it? Uh, so the short answer is yes. And timing is, does play a part in that. Um, a lot of, well, when I left the company the first time, I mentioned they did not have a strategy and they did not have a growth plan. And that's an important thing to understand about a company as well, because if they're not growing, the opportunities are not being presented. Because if a company's growing, they almost every company that I've ever heard about, their first thing to do is look within for promotion. And so if you've got a company that has a, a growth plan, they're looking within. So those opportunities will be there for you. And uh, so, you know, if you're in a company that is stagnant or is shrinking or, yeah, your timing isn't going to be optimum. Mm. So eye to the future, you know, if it's if it's a business cycle that you're in, there may be not a lot you can do about it, but you could run the cycle out. And when things start to happen again, you know, they should be growing and those opportunities should be present. Or if they're not, and you are in a position where um, you're maxed out, it may be time to look elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I don't know, excuse me, Nick, as you always know enough to know that it's the right company, but I think you could always choose to be the right employee. Okay. So sometimes, like you mentioned, a business cycle, you could be in a great real estate company and we go through this huge recession and, you know, did you pick the wrong company? Probably not. Business cycles are everywhere, but you could be the right employee during that time. So I would challenge yourself to, you know, make some of your own mm-hmm. luck. I, I, and I don't want you to feel frozen like, oh my gosh, does it have the right culture? And, and is this the right company? And is this the right time? It's like, just get out there, you know, and make something happen. I think you make your own luck. One of the the questions that we got ahead of time was from someone who is, you know, working in a field she didn't necessarily uh, expect to be in, who, you know, looking sort of toward with that eye towards transition from one kind of uh, company, one kind of a mindset to another. How, you know, obviously there's a lot of different ways that can play out, but what are some of the, the challenges there and how would you encourage people who are transitioning, whether it's to a new career, to a new field, how would you encourage them to think about that? And, you know, what are the things that they need to keep in mind during that process? Well, I deal with folks like that every day. (laughs) Um, So first of all, I I would say take heart. Okay, it can be done. But as far as being realistic, the further away from what you're doing that you want to get to, the longer it's going to take and the harder it's going to be. Because If you're a nurse and you say, I don't want to work as a nurse anymore, but I'd like to sell surgical supplies, that's not as big a leap as saying, well, I'm a nurse, but I would like to go 
and be an actress. Wow, that's going to take a long time to transition. So, you know, ask yourself, again, the self-awareness, what's the root of my discomfort? Why do I want to transition? Why do I feel I have to be in something totally different? So that you know, and then I would ask yourself in concentric circles, how could I make this easier on myself? Could I maybe do a two or three step transition? Do I have to jump from this to there? Because that's hard. It's hard to convince someone to hire you when nothing on your resume says you've had any experience ever being a chemist. You know, it's tough to get there. So you might take two or three steps, you know, look at the classes, the internships, the, you know, what would it take to get from there to here? And, you know, you might, you might need to parlay some of your current knowledge into the next field. It's very tough to, to jump totally, jump all in once. And, you know, Nick doesn't want me to do this, but I really wish we could let people ask questions. Does anyone have questions? Wouldn't you rather hear a question from the audience? Well, you just crushed okay? my dream of being a rodeo clown. So. <laughs> okay, you I'm talk not. about transition. Yeah, how are you going to be a rodeo clown? Let us no, know. He's already a clown. What do you mean? <laughs> I actually am super unqualified to answer this question, so <laughs> okay. I, would, I would defer to that. Uh, believe not. me, there couldn't have been a better person to answer that question. And again, I know Katie very well. Her experience, exposure to people, and that transition... And I get it at folks who are retired at 55 want to come back into the marketplace. And they, like you said, they want, they were a chemist and now they want to be a preacher. Right. You know, uh, what, you know, what are you, what are you thinking here? But the key factor is all the way back to know yourself. What do you like? What you don't like? Dissect it, take it apart, analyze it, what aspect of it is. And then that piece that's sitting there, begin building on it one by one. Focus one little bit at a time, and I and I speak from experience because once again, my son is a Wharton grad, so I understand business. So he and I had no problem communicating. My daughter, who takes after his mother, thank goodness, I have her mother rather, uh, is a scientist. I had no clue, so I immersed. I I took on assignments in that space, not as the key search person, but as the backup, doing the research, the secondary work, and eventually, I'm still not good at it. But at least I know our companies. Mm -hmm. And now I have this conversation taken on a different level. That, to me, was more rewarding than becoming a senior VP. But the transition I made from corporate America to an entrepreneur, gray hairs came from meeting payroll. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're sitting there in the recession and you got 53 offices around the world and you want to keep them all, mm -hmm. but you can't, how do you make those decisions? That was extremely transitional, but that was a... a a tough. I would never ran a business before. Now we were running a business. Katie, you were you were very gracious with your time, so I, I would like to make you happy. If the, does anyone have a, a specific <laughs> well, we'd like question? We'd like to know what like you're thinking. Definitely. Uh, um, what is the importance of uh, networking? I know that uh, LinkedIn is very important, and I use it frequently. But how important are the things like uh, Twitter or? Pinterest or Facebook in terms of uh, getting a job, like because I'm fresh out of college, so I'm looking to get into the field mm -hmm. of graphic design. Oh, graphic. Well, I think graphic design then Pinterest would matter, and and certain things. Uh, oh, what's the name of the site? I think it's called the Creative Group, where they um, have a lot of assignments that are less than full time project work that you can do, internships. I think you need to do some research on what, what those people are using to find people. Because LinkedIn, I think, at our age does matter. You know, Pinterest is not a place that I would look for a job, but if I was a graphic designer, maybe that would work to show examples of your work and for people that are, that are hiring there. But I think you could look at some places you want to work and find out where they are advertising. Um, you know, let's say a nonprofit, a lot of them advertise on Craigslist. Okay, so it's like, well, wow, you know, if you want to get that job, you would need to be on Indeed.com or you need to be on Craigslist. So I'd, I'd try to find out where they are searching so that you can have your information and your work there. Yeah. We use LinkedIn a lot. And right. uh, the paths it can take you are astronomical. Mm -hmm. But you got to be focused and you have to know what you're looking for because mm -hmm. you can get lost in the 15 screen you get to. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important that if you aren't wanting to get into that arena, find somebody who is in that company, right. to your point, and then dissect where they come from. Look at their resume. Where did they, how did they get to where they were? Hmm. And begin, and again, 
um, I'm a relationship person, not networking. Networking is, mm-hmm. is kind of superficial for me. Rela- networking, it isn't about having 20 million LinkedIn friends. Mm-hmm. It really is 5, 10, 15 people that I trust, maybe 20 more, maybe 100 more, mm-hmm. but usually just zeroing in on that one aspect. Mm-hmm. So when you look at somebody's resume and you want to be a manager, you look at five or six of those resumes, you get, begin to see a pattern that peripheral vision and being able to understand and read through what they got to, that's where you end up going. And to your point, Mike, you do your homework. As a math major, I never got credit unless I did my homework. I showed my homework. Mm-hmm. So even to this day, funny thing, I always tell my, I'm, I have homework to do every night to be able to get ready for the next day, no matter what it might be. So that's part of your homework. Dissect, bisect, analyze what is, what is at the heart of that and how do they get that way. You will see a pattern if you put five things in front of you. All of a sudden, you see something. Three of them did this. Four of them did that. Nobody did this, and I was thinking about that. So probability is not going to be in your favor. Well, in in your example with with a creative field like graphic design, you know, who are four or five graphic designers in town that are doing work you admire? You know, and where are they at? What firms and what, what kind of clients do they work on? And then you'll see that pattern. You know, and then you might be able to find one of them on LinkedIn and LinkedIn and ask him a question. Like you said, somebody called someone at White's yeah. and said, hey, it's a good place to work. You know, it's okay to say, wow, I admire your work. I saw this. I saw that. I'm young. I'm starting out. I wondered if you had some suggestions for me on, you know, where things are being advertised. So, you know, your pattern idea is great. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with LinkedIn. I get, I get in mails, I guess they call them all the time, from people I don't know. Uh, inquiring about, you know, the company, about, you know, what it takes to be employed there. Um, you know, and I always answer them because you never know where to lead. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I think that I, I personally think LinkedIn is a is a fantastic mm-hmm. tool. We use them quite a bit. We had a question over here. Well, yeah, uh, part of it was you know my thing with you talking about um, on resumes that that there's certain resumes where certain things on certain people's resumes, whether environment, where they're working. Um, you won't hire them. Where I guess where's the balance of that with something that maybe is that that company for the pride change the culture or you freaked that, people out with that. I <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Mike. Well yeah, so so it's a great question. So um really in, in this community here there's only two companies that I put that rule on, okay? And I happen to be very I have a lot of intimate knowledge of how those cultures are, and they are at at an extreme that is uh, unchangeable because a fish stinks from the head. And if the leader's still there, the culture's going to be what it's going to be. It's not going to change. And I just that's you, if you're coming in there thinking you're going to change it with that leader still there, you're not going to. And uh, so. Uh, you know, I don't want to scare anybody with that, but that's you know that's an extreme example maybe. Now, I, I will admit, I've hired people from those two companies who have been there a short time, six months. And because when I interview them, they say, oh, my God, I went in there and I made a huge mistake, and I got out as quick as I could. Bingo. You're my guy or gal because, uh, you know, they recognize what situation they got themselves in. So, you know, it's not black and white, but... You know, the example I used, and somebody was there for nine years, and they, they sent me a resume. I'm like, There's no, just, it's just not going to happen. Um, well, we'll have an opportunity uh, for you to speak with the panelists after we wrap up. The, the last question that I would like to ask you, this is admittedly broad, but I, I'm curious to know, you know, when you, either through your own experience as an employee or as a manager, when you see someone go from a good employee to a great employee, What's the common thread that you see? Obviously, for each person, for each job, there will be different specifics that make them a great employee. But what are the common threads that you see when people make that leap to to greatness? Their heart is in it. That would be the big change, is I can tell by the effort they're putting in, by the questions they ask, by how they recover from mistakes, by how willing they are to train new people is they've put their heart into it. And, and you can tell. You can tell somebody who's just confident 
versus somebody that's really committed. Yeah, I, I would agree completely with that. And also, if you leave behind a bunch of delighted customers, whether it's internal or external, uh, you get noticed. The other thing is, you know, leaning into problems and taking the tough assignments. And as a, as a boss, the thing I love to hear is when I have a tough assignment to hand out, don't worry, Mike, I'll take care of it. Mm. If somebody says that, um, yeah, that's, that's what every boss wants to hear is, um, you know, that they'll take care of it. And taking responsibility is another one. You know, I mentioned the water cooler whiner, don't be one of those. But taking responsibility means not blaming a bunch of, you know, blaming things on other people or outside influences. It's really doing that um, is, is a key for me. And then just being flexible and being open to change. These companies are changing rapidly now, and if you're if you're not willing to adapt and be flexible and change and help lead the change and be a part of that, you can get left behind. A broad question deserves a broad answer. It's called <laughs> emotional quotient and all the things they both define. And in today's day and age, I love that person that does, aha, I got it. Ten things are happening. Seemingly 10 different disparate ideas, and they find the thread to solve that problem. That's emotional quotient. Katie defined it very eloquently. Mike did the same thing. That's what it means. And it's taking that intellectual capacity, an emotional quotient, and they got it all. Right brain, left brain working together, balance. Well, uh, before we, we wrap up the formal part, we do want to take the opportunity to give away the HD radio. Uh, please do stick around. We've got this space for about 40 more minutes. Uh, so you've got some time to speak one-on-one -on -one with our panelists. Uh, and we've also got our uh, community partners here, Image and Marketing and Rio Salado Career Services. So please do take the opportunity, take advantage of uh, speaking with them. You'll probably win. Good idea. Our fun bingo wheel is broken. All right. Uh, Jill Smith. All right. Hey. Come on up. Congratulations. And Jill's a sustaining member on top of it all. So. Congratulations. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists, David, uh, David Mike, Katie. It was really a pleasure. Uh, thank you to our hosts here at Rio Salado, to Linda Pastori and Emilio Cabrera, who helped to put this together. Uh, everybody in, in KJZZ's development part, uh, department who helped to make this event happen. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I'm Nick Blumberg, and I hope you have a great night. Thanks for coming out.